Hey, are we back? Can you hear? Can you guys see and hear me okay? Hmm. Just a picture of a vase still. Hmm. Are, are we back? That's weird. Um, could be just a drop <clears throat> an internet connection problem. Sorry about that, guys. Um, gosh, what was the last thing I was talking about before it cut out? Um, so I'll just backtrack a little bit. Um, sorry about the interruption there. <clears throat> hey, guys. Thanks for sticking with me. God, I would just like one live stream without something going wrong. Such is the nature of the beast. Um, anyway, so let's get back to the workspace here. Can you still see me now and hear me? Just double checking. I'll keep an eye on the uh, on the chat window. Uh, anyway, so I've got warm and cool lighting going on here. Uh, I took this picture yesterday from the vantage point where I'll be sitting and looking at my still life. I'm looking at a real still life setup here in my studio. I'm looking at this exact thing. Uh, I took the picture yesterday under warm and cool lighting. And uh, today I'm just going to paint from the warm uh, lit uh, photograph. Uh, if you were with me last week, we did the uh, color theory video, and where we talked about how when you have a light, uh, warm light source, you tend to get cooler shadows, and a cooler shadow, a cooler light source, you get warm shadows. So overall, you'll I'll, I'll talk about what I'm seeing here versus what's in the photograph because the photograph doesn't always do the greatest job of um, replicating what the human eye can do. So we'll talk about those differences and why it's important to paint from life as much as possible. Uh, so I don't know if you heard my spiel at the beginning about how great uh, uh, painting from life is, but still lifes are the best of all worlds where you can control the lighting, uh, the amount of time that you're there in front of the subject. The lighting doesn't change like when you're out in the landscape. Uh, you don't have to pay for a model. You can paint anything you've got around your house. And uh, as long as you can light it in a way that is uh, consistent and you can control the environment a little bit, uh, it's a great way to practice your techniques. Uh, you, you just because you have all this lim unlimited amount of time, you can practice your brushwork, thin or thick, hard, soft edges. Uh, it's a, the best way, I think, to practice technique and get better and develop your own personal style when you're uh, when you're painting. Hey, Hossein, you just discovered the channel a week ago. Well, thanks for joining us. I try to do a lot of live streams once a week where I can talk to you guys and do diff art demos of different kinds. Sometimes it's caricature. Sometimes it's just anything about art. All right, um, cool. So what I like to do, I'll show you how I get started on a digital painting, uh, especially if I'm trying to replicate the look of a traditional oil painting. I like to start on a background that looks like a canvas or it can be any kind of surface really, but this is just happens to be a canvas texture that I scanned in a few years ago and I use it sometimes to texture my brushes, uh, but it works great as a background to paint too. Um, so actually I've got a couple different textures here and what I think I might do is actually overlay them just to give it a little bit more visual interest and break up the evenness of the canvas. So this is just some old concrete wall texture I downloaded from somewhere. Let's spin that around and we'll blow it up. And then to get the two to interact, uh, you can change the blending mode. Uh, let's get the layer palette visible here. Uh, so different blending modes work. Uh, usually overlay or soft light is usually the best to have two layers interact with one another. There's overlay. So you can see both the, the canvas texture and the concrete texture. Let's see here's soft light. Uh, let's go back to uh, overlay. Overlay is pretty good. And then I'll go ahead and, and merge these two layers. Um, it's a little greenish though. I'm going to, uh, I think, desaturate it a little bit to get it a little bit more neutral of a ground to work on. There we go. All right, and also I'm not sure how much at the beginning I got cut off, but I got a new microphone, and I'm sorry if my voice is a little out of sync uh, with the video, but I'll make that sure that's fixed for next week.
All right, so let's just make this a little bigger. And I'm gonna start a new layer and do a real quick drawing. It's not important to do a super detailed drawing when doing a a la prima style painting like this, uh, but you gotta have something to start. All right, so I'm on a new layer above the canvas layer so I can move it around if necessary. And I'm gonna start with that vase, but I'm gonna give myself a little bit of assistance, which is something that's, you know, kind of a digital cheat, uh, something that makes your life a little bit easier, but I'm gonna turn on symmetry drawing, uh, which will help make sure I get the, uh, the vase perfectly symmetrical. Try to get the proportions, the overall height to width correct. And it's not super important that it's exact, unless it's someone's vase that they commissioned you to paint and it has to look exactly like what it's supposed to look like. But but I do try to make it accurate as just as a matter of habit. And symmetry drawing is just this little button here at the top uh, of the screen. It's one of the brush options when you're working in Photoshop. A lot of different painting programs have that, so it's not that special. It feels pretty good. The overall proportions, the flare of the top and the flare of the bottom. Maybe it can be a little wider at the top, I think. I'm trying to get the perspective right, too, just sort of eyeballing it right now. Maybe a little bit more of a bulbous shape at the very, very bottom here. Cool. Now let's size that down to about how big it should be in the canvas. Get the placement roughly where it should be. I think the top is a little too rounded. Flatten that out just a bit. And something like this, there's no real need to indicate the light and shadow but you can if you want if you really want to be real specific about it uh, now the apple just uh, I'm gonna try to find the height and the width I know the one side comes to right about here it divides the base here splits it not in, quite in half though and the apple comes down a little lower than the bottom of the vase here and just kind of trying to find the height and width overall Right about there, I think, is about how high it is. There we go. And let's erase some of that vase on the inside of the apple. And find the shadows and the tops of the table. And there is uh, the cast shadow on the wall. I think I'll put it on there. It'll add some context. Let's the viewer know that the uh, wall is right behind the setup. So the lighting is really low. It's um, I can only get it so high. It's usually I like to light things from above, but it doesn't really matter. It kind of looks now like it's lit by a light source on the table with it, like maybe it's a candle right next to it. Uh, when I took this photo, I kind of liked how it ended up looking like a real old world feel, like something like Rembrandt might have painted. So that's going to inform my painting. It's going to help me decide to uh, think about what kind of atmosphere and mood I want. I want it to definitely be a warm lighting situation, uh, like not artificial light, but natural candlelight and uh, uh, kind of a romantic feeling, not romance like, you know, romance, romance, but romantic as in sort of an idealized version of, of what's going on here. And um, I want uh, the air to feel soft and the whole mood to be 
just everything's connected. So I'm going to maybe play with some edges, uh, make things softer than they are in places, harder in others. I also want to get the reflections of the metal, make the metal feel real. And of course, the difference between the metal patina and the surface of the fruit. All right, so I'm going to work on a layer right now real quick in between the canvas layer and the line drawing layer. So I'm going to just stain the canvas. And this is what I would do if I was working on oils. I would thin down the paint and just kind of stain in some, some contrasting colors, not necessarily the colors I'm going to end up going with, but this is kind of a, you know, a personal choice. I like to often use colors that are complementary or opposite to what is end up what I, what's going to end up being there. So I might go a little cooler with some of this initially. Maybe a dirty bluish color. But I don't want to kill the canvas. I want to, you know, preserve that uh, neat texture that's there. So I'm just going to do really light strokes. Uh, the flow on this brush is down to about 40%, so it's not pushing out a lot of paint. Um, <clears throat> I just want to create some randomness and some noise and uh, different color vibrations throughout the painting. Uh, I've got some blue. Let's go now maybe a darker red in places. Let's get a, a bigger brush. Pretend I just have a giant paintbrush here. Covers a lot more at once. And this is not how I always work. This is just uh, when I'm, how I'm working today. You know, just it's, I just feel inspired to paint this way, just mixing some different colors before starting. Because I want the end result to be more painterly, uh, maybe some exaggerated colors here and there. Now I'm going to some greens. I just want colors underneath that when you see the final result, you might see some of these colors popping through in places. Okay. Now let's get to some real staining where I'm going to go a little bit more a fuller value range. So it's going to be a dark reddish brown, sort of like a burnt sienna. Or I, I usually use transparent red oxide myself when I'm doing stains. That's a real nice, uh, very chromatic dark color. And you don't really need to stay in the lines. It's not what the stage is about. Um, Drumroll asks if I put the mirror behind my back on purpose or just happened to be there. Um, no, that's just my closet is mirrored, so it's always there. It's actually kind of a pain in the butt because when I do try to live stream and or have Zoom meetings, I gotta put a curtain up or something, or people see the back of my head and my computer screen. <laughs> kind of wish I didn't have it there, but it's the best arrangement in my studio for how my desk is shaped. I'm gonna, if I place a color somewhere, I'm gonna place it in other places as well uh, so that there's um, some echoes of that color throughout the composition. It's being pretty sloppy. Hossein says, uh, still life is interesting for me color-wise, but uh, form-wise they just seem so ordinary and simple for me. Somehow boring. <laughs> what can I do to make them more fun for me to draw? Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter what the subject matter is, I think, in any kind of painting, whether you're painting a person or an object or a landscape. The subject can be anything. It's the painter that makes it interesting based on how they paint it. Uh, so I, I played a, um, a slideshow of some really cool still life paintings by famous artists at the beginning of my stream. So um, it's not, you know, all the still life paintings that I like. I mean, I like a lot more, but those are the ones I was able to find really quickly. 
Um, but on the replay, maybe go back and check out some of those because it's just the way some of the, those things are painted are just beautiful. One of the paintings by uh, Antoine Vallon is just a giant mound of butter uh, and some eggs at the bottom. And if you look so if you look closely at that painting, it's just broad, heavy, thick strokes, kind of like he's painting with butter. Uh, but it's so intriguing. I just can't stop looking at that painting of this mound of butter. Uh, and if in another artist's hands, that mound of butter wouldn't have been as interesting, but he made it interesting. Uh, you just want to keep looking at it. So it's something that you have to, I think, work to make interesting. And I think it's based on your paint application, your edge work, your color harmonies. That's what's going to draw people to it. Um, also, directing the viewer's eye to where you want with some values. So you want to make sure you light your center of interest with a lot of contrast. So it's a light set up against a dark. Uh, set up some uh, overlapping forms. If you notice, my two objects here are not side by side. Uh, they're not equal size. They're, they're different size. There's different heights. There's some contrast. One's overlapping another. Uh, and I think that creates more visual interest. So there is an art to uh, setting up a still life composition. And then, of course, how you execute it is critical. Okay, so I'm now going to just go ahead and flatten or merge these two layers, the drawing layer and uh, the color layer that I've got here. Uh, because I just don't need to preserve the line art you know, much longer. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and start uh, painting here, but I'm going to get a different brush, something with a lot of, uh, I don't know, texture or streakiness. Let's see here. That's got some good streakiness to it, I guess. Uh, let's, but let's get a darker color. And let's start with the darkest darks in the composition. I'm going to get a dark reddish orange here. Um, actually, that's seems a little not even quite dark enough I'm gonna go a little bit more chromatic a little closer to orange here I'm gonna start painting in this vase and I'm gonna be kind of just quick with my strokes here not being too careful that's not what it's about you're gonna get you know too precious of a result if you if you uh, are precious with the painting just go ahead and go into it if you want that kind of cool a la prima painting style just, you know, keep it loose. Keep the brushes big, don't zoom in on it. And let's see, the shadow color in the apple is gonna be a little lighter. I'm looking at it right now, uh, it's a little re uh, more red. A little more red is visible, but it's kind of a cooler red, at least cooler than on the um, lit side. And again, it's going to be a little bit different from the photo um, because I'm seeing more values here than what you're seeing in the photo. I'm going to go just a little bit darker. There's a little bit of the apple reflecting into the surface of the metal here, so I'm going to put a color note of red right there in that vase. And let's see, let's go a little warm and lighter on the surface of that vase on the lit side. Make that brush a little bigger. And remember, that something really reflective like this is also going to pick up a lot of color from the environment. I've got this tablecloth down here, which is probably the most saturated color in the composition. So I'm going to get that in here pretty early here right now, actually. And um, maybe even a little more red and saturated than that. There we go, that feels a little more like what I'm seeing here. So the vase is going to pick up a lot of this orangish red from the tablecloth because it's so shiny and bright.
It's good to paint over the lines too. Just go back and forth a lot. Don't try to stay within the lines. It's not like the coloring books when you're a kid. If you want to really play with edges, you have to uh, not be afraid to cover up and erase those lines. And I'm trying to leave gaps between my paint strokes whenever I can to let those colors underneath show through. All right, the reflected light on this uh, vase is going to be darker, not quite as saturated as the tablecloth. And if I do want to add some more saturated colors, I'll build up to it. Um, I just don't need to go for it right now. Painting is a layering process, I think, when it's done right. All right, let's get this apple a little warmer here, a little more closer to yellow, a little more saturated. And let's go a little darker and a little more saturated as the apple moves away from the light and into shadow. Hey, welcome, Eric. Uh, yes, I am working from uh, life. I've got this still life set up here in my studio, and uh, but I, I took a picture of it for your, for your guys' benefit. And I'm talking about the differences between what I'm seeing in real life versus what's in the photo that you're seeing. And the shadow of the apple on the table has a bit of reflected light coming down onto it from that cardboard behind uh, the subject. So it's going to be a little, it's got some warmth in it and some luminosity. But closer to the apple, it's going to get a lot darker because of what's called, I think it's called the occlusion shadow or just where there's less reflected light that can get inside that shadow area. And some place like here is a real good place to blend or lose an edge. Uh, you might be able to see a differentiation between it in real life or on that photo, but in a painting, you got to find places, I think, to blend and soften the edges. Uh, Lynn asks, what are your thoughts on the mixer brush in Photoshop? Do you use it? Do you think it's a good attempt at digitally simulating real paints? Uh, yes, if it's done right and if you set it up correctly, I think it can be a great tool. I've actually got a couple blender brushes, but they're streaky blender brushes. Uh, they've got a lot of texture. I've got one blender brush that's not only streaky, but has texture applied to it. So it creates a nice soft uh, uh, blend that has a lot of character. If it's just an airbrush or totally smooth smudging tool, I hate it because it just it, it erases any kind of interest or brush stroke that's there. So I'll show it to you a little bit later. Uh, Hossein says, uh, my drawings seem to lose their structure when I paint over the lines. Why is that, even though I paint in layers? Um, it happens to all of us, you know, as soon as you start painting over the lines, you lose your drawing. And you just have to refine it. And the secret is you just have to be really, really good at drawing. <laughs> because you're constantly redrawing it as you're painting. Uh, I learned that early on in oil painting. Because there's, you know, there's no going back. Once you cover up your lines in an oil painting, you can't just you know, like in a digital painting, make the line layer come back if you want. So that's actually why I like to, I'm, I'm painting over my lines now. I won't be able to bring them back. It's uh, sort of a point of no return. Because uh, I, I, I do like to simulate the feeling of uh, the process of painting in real oils. Because I think it makes me more honest, you know, it keeps me on my toes and I don't take the painting for granted.
No, Hossein, there's no obvious or bad questions. It's uh, If it's a concern you have, then that's a valid question. <laughs> and, you know, there's you're probably experiencing a lot of the same things other people are, so maybe someone else who didn't feel good enough about asking a question, maybe you'll ask it for them and you'll do you guys both a favor. So it's, it's good to ask questions, no matter how obvious you think they may be. I'm going to switch to a different brush here. I don't want my painting to get too monotonous. Uh, so let's see. I've got um, sort of a more textured brush, I think, here. Yeah, let's, yeah, it's not as textured as I would like here. Let's see. Yeah, that's got some good um, texture popping on that one there. Yeah, I'm always switching brushes just to prevent the monotony of that same brush everywhere and the same texture. And I recommend you do the same if you want that traditional look. This one, though, the texture is a little more subtle and you may not be seeing it uh, at, at this level of resolution. If I zoom in more, you'll be able to see it. Um, Axel asks, are they a crutch or should we rely on them? Uh, what do you mean, or is what a crutch? Um, I maybe forgot what we were talking about earlier. Uh, oh, the mixer brush, meaning, is that what you're talking about, Axel? The mixer brush being a, uh, yeah, about blending brushes. Yeah, so don't rely on them too much. I just, I use blending brushes, even the good ones that I've made, very sparingly. It's, they're just for effects here and there. Um, but, you know, it depends on your own personal artistic style. If you want to go a little more crazy and brushy and expressive, uh, you'll use it more. And just, there's no way to uh, un know if you like it, then just experiment and see if you like it. Uh, you like uh, Cezanne still life. It's cool. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Lester asks, you can also keep your drawing on top, uh, top layer and lock it, and other layers stay before it. And when finished, you can unlock and delete the top layer. Yeah, there's lots of methods you can work in in Photoshop. I just like to replicate the process of feeling like it's an oil painting, so I like to sometimes just get rid of the original drawing. If it's an important client drawing where it's a, a, a likeness of somebody, and I definitely want to make sure I don't drift off the likeness too much, I do sometimes keep that uh, line art layer separate and protected. Um, but stuff like this, uh, you know, it's, you know, I can definitely fix this vase if I think it's getting off track. Uh, and I don't have to worry about losing the likeness. Okay, let's get that uh, color for the background in, too. It's definitely warm and yellowish, yellowish red. So, orange, basically. It's a slightly lighter value than the uh, where that table is there, but I haven't fully finished that table. Yeah, and again, referring back to the losing the line art layer, um, in, a, in a painting where you want it to look a la prima, wet into wet oil painting, you don't want any trace of that line art layer visible. And you don't want to feel restricted by those lines because they'll prevent you from exploring your edge work because you'll want to preserve that edge as a hard edge. And I like to try to get rid of it if I can just because I want to judge my edges as I go. Like I might want to lose, like say where the... Um, the background is a very similar value to the front of the vase here. Maybe I'll lose that edge a little bit, but not totally. You know, I don't want to lose the shape, um, but it's a, it's a good place to blend, uh, to soften an edge. And with the line art visible, it, it, it often kind of holds you back, I think, from having that kind of uh, experimentation going on. Uh, Eric asks, when I paint in real media, do I switch brushes often? Uh, yeah. Um, some paintings I'll just use three or four brushes. Some paintings I'll use ten. 
Uh, and it, oftentimes it's just because I need a different size brush. Uh, but I only have two basic kinds of brushes. Those are the heavy hog's hair bristles and softer uh, mongoose style sables. And they both get different effects. The mongoose sables can soften and blend edges, but while keeping cool, interesting shapes and brush strokes. Whereas the hog's hair bristles can, you can pile on a lot of paint and get a th good, thick impasto brush stroke. They're a little stiffer in general. So, uh, yeah, so I, I do, but um, it's more of just for size. And also, if you get too much paint on your brush, like in too much dark paint, you don't want to keep on cleaning that same brush over, so you'll get in a similar brush and use it for your light colors, and you'll switch them back and forth between the two brushes just because you don't want to constantly contaminate or try to clean that brush off. Uh... DevShack asks, is there any chance you could leave the color picker window open, maybe in a gray area between your cam and the canvas? Um, yeah, I mean, if it's going to be helpful to you, I um, I usually don't leave it visible because I don't use, I mean, I use it a, f a few times, but then as I progress in the painting, I don't use it as much uh, because it's, uh, I often like to select colors from the painting itself. Let's see, you know, where, where, Ooh, well, that glyphs, that's the wrong one. <laughs> There it is. And I guess I'll shrink it down so it doesn't take up too much space. But yeah, I mean, that'll help you see what colors I'm using, I guess, as I'm using them. Um, I just have limited screen real estate, so I often don't keep it on screen. I just call it up whenever I need it. Uh, Hossein asks, or says, it'll be good if you make a live stream about shading and lighting direction and such. Okay, good. Thanks for the comment. I'm always, I love hearing comments about what I should do next because I, I often have a hard time thinking about what I should be doing next. Let's get a bigger brush here. So there's a bit of um, an effect going on because of the spotlight effect happening. There's, I think, darker values around the edges of the painting. And that's good compositionally because it helps focus the viewer's eyes towards the center if you darken things around the periphery. And I might exaggerate that effect a little bit too. Here you can see some of the texture of this brush here. It's, uh, it's not a streaky brush. It's a, uh, you know, a sort of a grainy brush. So there's a lot of... Uh, interplay between that and the paint layers behind it. Uh, Jim says, if you were doing a commercial digital project for like a magazine, how do you si out, work out size and resolution? Uh, well, I like to know how big they're going to print it, so I make sure it's at least that size. But my own, just I have a own, my own rule of thumb. I generally, if I'm doing something, anything for print, I don't like to go below 300 DPI at like 12 by 16 inches in Photoshop. Uh, and I think 16 by 20 inches is a little safer because, you know, there, you can get in and get a little, a little more detail when necessary. And you never know when a client or further on down the road, you may want to make a large print of it if it becomes a popular painting. Um, you'll have the option to print it bigger uh, if you have a, a file size around that size. And if your computer can handle it, and I think most computers this day these days can handle, uh, you know, 16 by 20 inch size files. Uh, but the more layers you add to a project, the more resources it takes up and might crash your system. So that's another reason I don't love working in tons of layers is because it's more memory intensive. Okay, just work on the background a little bit, trying to draw some attention to this uh, area between the apple and the vase. I'm increasing the value a little bit. So there's some nice contrast there. Maybe even push up the the contrast a little more, making it a little more yellow, a little brighter. 
right here at the center. Uh, Eric asks or says, I like using filberts in rounds, but I don't have many that are large, so I end up spending a lot of time covering the canvas in tiny strokes. Yeah, get a, get a few bigger brushes. I think you'll enjoy the difference. And they don't have to be expensive. I mean, brushes are the one thing where you can go really cheap uh, in, in oil or acrylic painting and still get great results. Uh, the places where you shouldn't be cheap is the quality of the paints themselves. You know, don't don't ever get student-grade oil paints. They're the worst. They'll, they'll frustrate you more than anything else because there's just a less pigment load in them. They're not as um, saturated. So you end up having to mix a whole lot more into it, and it creates bad mixing habits. And you end up going through the paint really fast anyway and then having to buy more because it's just not as powerful a paint. Um, and not all that, not all paints are that expensive. Just a few of the heavy metal ones like cadmiums and cobalts and um, ceruleans and... Um, but yeah, you'll have to invest more in the paints than in the brushes. Drimmerult asks, could you talk about shape design? I keep hearing that we should make shadow and light area and light shapes interesting in our painting, but I still don't understand what is considered to be interesting enough. Um, yeah, that's what's interesting is whatever draws the viewer's eye, if you ask me. So to me, one of the things that always draws my attention in a painting is uh, contrast. Contrast of value, contrast of color, contrast of shape. So if you've got a round shape, it's good to set it up against a straight shape. Or, you know, a shape that's horizontal, set it up against something that's vertical. Or, or diagonals are often more interesting than, you know, either of the other two angles. Uh, there's lots of ways to create interest. And the shape design itself is just, think of it as, in terms of, don't be so literal in the thing that you're designing. Like, don't design a vase. Design a cool shape that is reminiscent of a vase. Um, so it's going to have pleasing proportions and pleasing edges and, you know, you could fiddle with the contours a little bit if you want to, to play with it, but it's not, um, anything there's like, there's not just one standard where I can tell you what's interesting. Um, there's just a lot of factors that go into making a shape interesting. So all these imperfections in the brush strokes, um, you know, I start to paint over quite a bit of them, but I like to leave as much as possible from earlier, messier stages of the painting because they then become the texture. They become the um, added interest that are sort of like happy accidents. So it's why it's important not to just go crazy and paint over everything you were doing at the earlier stages. Try to let those earlier stages show through. I'm still in the blocking in phase. I really haven't started refining these shapes much yet. Um, so as I do, I'll let you know. But as I do, there will also be more color notes that I'm going to add in places. You know, because I, I see subtle greens and blues and grays and purples and just all these other little colors that aren't quite visible in the photo. You see most of the very cool variation in the metal, and that's just because of the nature of the metal. It picks up everything that's around it. But it'll be in places on the apple too, because an apple has a pretty irregular surface. There's a, you know, spottiness to it. Let me see if I can work a little bit in there right now, actually. So there's a, you know, some green back here. If it's too light though, it'll break the illusion of the shadow. So yeah, it's still too light. Let me darken that a bit more. There we go. Hossein says, also please talk about where to put the highlight. Is there a measure or a rule? Um, yeah, yeah, there's, um, the, the apple is actually a great example here of how highlights and light on form works. So the highlight 
let's see. So the how the apple is lit, the form lighting on the apple, how it's like sort of divided in half. One half is in light, one half is in darkness. If I change my perspective, if I move right or left, that relative position of that of this divider line is going to stay in that same place on the apple when I'm looking at it in real life. However, what changes is the highlight. Um, right now, the highlight is just here where it is on that apple. But if I move my body far off to the right, that highlight is going to change places because the highlight is essentially like a reflection of the light source. And it's not the same as the form light hitting the apple. So it's, it changes based on your position. So um, there's never one right place to put the highlight that it's it, in, in a sense where it's not tied to the position of the form shadows. It depends on where you are in relation to the light, to the light source. So right here, the highlight's going to be, you know, right there. But if I were to move over here, the, you know, I see more of a crescent moon shape of the, um, the apple uh, as far as the shadow goes. And then the highlight moves over to the right. So I don't know if that helps or makes sense. It's not super valuable to know about when painting a static image from a particular location. But a lot of people maybe tend to want to put the highlight at the exact place where they think the light is strongest on the apple. So if the, the form light is strongest, say, right here where you got the brightest form light, where my cursor is, people tend to want to put the highlight there. But that's not how the highlights work. The highlight is like, it's like a mirror. It's mirroring the surface. Um, so yeah, if you look, hold up a mirror to the light, you'll see a direct reflection of that light source in the mirror. And depending on how reflective your object is, the, uh, the apple, the vase, it'll act like a mirror in that respect for the highlight, but not for the form shadows and the form lighting. Um, Stan Prokopenko has a really great video on form and lighting. It's one of his earliest tutorial videos. I'm not sure exactly what it's called, but it might just be called... Just go to his YouTube page and go to, like, I don't know, form, value, lighting. And he talks about these concepts. He talks about, you know, what, you know, reflected light and uh, occlusion shadows and terminators or... We call them... We tend to call the terminator... Um, what is it? The, the core shadow. Uh, so along the apple, there might be the darkest shadow would be right here, right after the terminator, where the light moves into darkness. And then there'll be more reflected light coming in, hitting the apple on its backside. And it'll create the effect of a darker band of color down the center of the apple, called the core shadow. And we don't call it the core shadow because there's an apple and it has a core. <laughs> it's called the core shadow no matter what form it's on. And again, depending on the level of reflectivity of your object and what's around it in the room, you'll see a stronger reflected light and a stronger core shadow. You might see a weaker reflected light and a uh, weaker core shadow. Uh, Hossein says, what's a la prima? Oh, good question. I sometimes take it for granted. People know all these painting terms. Uh, a la prima is just, uh, I think it's Italian for uh, at the first stroke. And it's just sort of a catch-all term meaning... Um, in its purest form, it's you lay down a paint stroke with your brush and you leave it there and you never touch it again, meaning the effect you see is the first stroke. There's never a second stroke. <laughs> um, no one really works that way in reality. Well, very few people anyway. Um, but it's used generally to describe wet into wet painting where you don't overly blend everything. Uh, some people call it direct painting or wet into wet painting. Uh, I've heard those terms. They're sort of all synonymous. Okay, let's get a little more lighter values on here. There's um, the brightest bright in the composition is uh, this tablecloth here reflecting the light from the light source. And you don't want to go too long in your painting without having your brightest bright and your darkest dark because those are what help you judge a lot of the other values. And they're fun to put in, but um, the meat of the painting is always going to be the... Uh, the half tones, everything that's in between. Uh, but uh, you're going to be able to judge your values and your half tones better if you have your brightest brights and your darkest darks. We got the darkest darks in there quite a while ago. Um, I don't think I ever put in pure black, and I almost never put in pure white unless it's really, really called for. But I'm looking at it here, and the photograph is definitely going to be more washed out 
in the lights here. It's a lot more white than what I'm really seeing. What I'm really seeing is this bright, bright orange light. So I think actually I, uh, I'm getting a little confused. I'm looking at the photo reference because it's a habit. <laughs> Uh, I really shouldn't be on, I need to be looking at the real object in front of me, and it looks more like this. Because my eyes are able to adjust on the fly and see a fuller range of values when I look at an area than the camera is able to. So if you paint from life like this, you're going to get a result that has a lot more subtlety, and people are going to, I think, respond to it more differently than if you uh, did a painting just from photos. It's still the brightest spot in the composition, aside from maybe the reflection of the highlights on the vase, but um, not as bright as what it is in the photo that you're seeing. Yeah, a little brighter along the ridge here where this corner of the table is. Okay, let's spend a little more time on this vase because it needs some attention. Uh, see, Mary asks, letting earlier rough strokes show through as happy accidents controlled by the flow, not opacity? Uh, a little bit by both. Um, it's uh, the pressure of your stroke, which is related to the opacity, but I like to use lower flow on these brushes um, because it's kind of like you're restricting the amount of paint that's coming out of the brush, but you can go full value whenever you need to, or you can go full opacity when you need to with a brush that has 100% opacity, but with low flow turned on. So that's, I think you get better artistic control that way. Also what helps the under colors show through is uh, a brush that has a lot of texture or streaks on it. Um, and that's, and also you're just painting with leaving gaps in between your brush strokes. So it's, it's a lot of things. Uh, Danilo says it's the Proco video that's, oh, shading, light, and form basics. Yeah, so check out that video. It's a great video, Hossein, on, um, on the basic concepts of shading, light, and value on forms. Court, do you have any website or place where I could download the brushes and blending you have? Uh, yeah, I'm working on that, actually. Thanks for asking. I've been working on it for several weeks, actually. So all my brushes here I've made, and um, I'm going to be offering them pretty soon. I'm just, I, I want a few more brush uh, variety, uh, brush type varieties before I offer it. And I know brush sets don't have to be perfect. You can always update them as you go, and I will. But uh, I want a real nice, well-rounded brush package for you guys, and I'll let you know when that's available. And they're brushes that are going to be focused on giving you a more uh, traditional look to your digital paintings. You know, some other artists have different values or different, I'm sorry, different priorities when giving you their brushes, like maybe they're for concept design and they have a lot of real cool, funky, unusual textures or patterns in them, uh, but that's not appropriate for what I like to do. So mine will be very focused on a real natural look. Okay, I'm gonna switch more to a, back to a, uh, well, I guess a harder edge brush here. Yeah, let's see. Based on what I've got going on here, I think there's a little more yellowish gray in the uh, in the, the vase metal that's um, facing the light very warm yellowish blackish gray There's a lot of colors in this environment uh, that I want to push back into the uh, vase, like the color from the tablecloth. It's going to be dimmer here. That was too bright, but um, that's what's going to make metal look like metal is if it's picking up the colors, what's around it. I think it's a little reddish uh, at the bottom here, I think, of the vase. Just a warmer color overall. What really helps sell 
the illusion of a metallic reflective surface, I think, is a nice balance of warms and cools, more so than on any other type of material. And the older the metal, the more that effect will be visible. Hussain says, I guess there is a design in colors too. I mean, a process that you can repeat, success that you can achieve repeatedly, not by happy accident. Uh, yeah, and uh, I don't know if you did see the color theory video from last week, but I spent a lot of time talking about just how to control colors, uh, the properties of colors, how they all have their own independent uh, value, their own level of saturation, and, um, and whatever hue they are is basically the three properties of color. And to achieve color harmonies, I mean, it's a big subject. I talked about it a lot last week, so don't want to retread over the same uh, subject I went over. So hopefully you can get a chance to watch that. I uh, kind of threw everything I knew about color theory into that talk last week. So that's as good as it's going to get for me, I think, on color. Whenever possible, I do like to grab, again, colors from around the composition, just colors that are already there when I'm coloring in a metallic surface, so that it's a re true reflection of everything that's around it. I'm always on the lookout for still life objects. My wife will attest anytime we pass by a, through a town or on a road trip, I'm always asking to stop at antique malls and antique stores just to see what kind of good cheap, you know, objects they have that I could just throw in the car and take back home with me to uh, it eventually just gets thrown onto a shelf, um, hopefully to be painted one day. But I've got a lot of different uh, objects with different surfaces, like glass objects, metallic objects. Um, just because I always have that eye, I'm keeping it out, keeping my eye out for uh, potential still life objects for paintings. It's kind of an addiction, actually. Again, can't forget about the reflection of that apple in the uh, vase there. I'm going to switch over to a softer rounded brush, but it still has a bit of texture applied to it. And this will just help soften some of these uh, transitions. And I really want to get to those highlights, of course, but I haven't earned them yet. I got to uh, continue building up the different uh, color notes, the warms and the cools here. Uh, because there's a lot of age and patina on this uh, vase. And the more irregular it is, the more authentic it's going to look. Uh, DevShack says, you touch the canvas once per stroke, right? You're not putting the pen down and go back and forth a few times. I just realized maybe that's why my digital paintings look more blurry than traditional. Um, yeah, I think I do. Um, with this mic, I don't know if you can hear my pen taps. Maybe you can hear them a little bit. But I'm constantly tap, 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 tap. I'm not just tap and scrubbing back and forth. Unless I'm filling in a huge area like on the background, maybe I'll do a bit of that scrubbing motion. But yeah, generally I like to lift the pen. And I'm constantly switching over. Like when you see when it switches over here to an eyedropper tool, that just means I'm sampling a color when I'm doing that. Um, I usually try to sample a neighboring color to bring it into the area I'm painting. And I go back and forth like that a lot. Or I'll sample this apple to lay in a color there and like oh that's too strong I'll I'll sample some black and to dim it down a little bit um, so yeah that's how I help achieve that look of um, color harmony where I'm 
uh, borrowing colors from everywhere else in the composition so that there's a real unified feeling to all the colors that are there because every color that I have is from somewhere uh, that exists in the painting already. And I think I, uh, I'm seeing some cool, crisp lights on this. Uh, they're not highlights quite. They're like more like rim lighting. They're coming in from my window in the studio. Um, they're very minor, but they're around the edges here. And I think that's going to help sell the concept too. So I think I can put those in without too much guilt. It's going to help make it feel a little more metallic. And it's important to break up the strokes, not make them too uniform looking. And I'm always changing the relative intensity or the brightness of different highlights I'm putting in places. Because that is how it works, you know, the, the, the highlights on the left, that those blue highlights aren't as bright as the ones that are going to be on the right, because, just because of the position where it's at, you know, next to my window. In real life, that uh, highlight or that rim lighting on the upper right is even more bright and pure than what's visible in the photo. I was going a little bit darker on the shadow side of the uh, of the vase here. So I'm going to go a little darker, a little cooler for the darker side of the vase over here. Keep my brush strokes really irregular and just, you know, don't scrub over a whole area all at once. Okay, and this is an even more subtle shading brush here than the one I was using. It's um, uh, just got a lot of texture applied to it, so every stroke that I lay down, it's uh, not putting down too much paint. Let's go a little lighter and a little cooler here now for the lit side of the metal. But I don't want to lay down paint so heavy that I'm covering up the stuff from earlier. I want those warms to show through. I'm almost like almost glazing it. Um, when you're doing a la prima wet into wet painting, you don't tend to do a lot of glazing where you paint thin down, washed out paint on top of other paint. But you can. You know, there's no rules really. Um, it just depends on how realistic, how soft, how subtle you want to be in your um, shading process and rendering. There's some uh, smaller marks here where, I don't know, maybe old fingerprints have worn away at the surface of the metal. So there's a lot of imperfections of various sizes.
feel like I need a little more contrast over here where the uh, background meets the objects. So I'm taking a little, little artistic license. It's, it's, it's lighter and cooler than what I'm really seeing, but I think the painting kind of needs it. It's getting too warm and too, uh, it's still too dark everywhere. Uh, Hossein asks, how to find the average for exaggerating something like cars and man-made objects, giving it human personality? I watched the animal video, but what about something like a vase? How can you, can you give personality to? Um, that's a good question. Um, that might be something more for a question more for someone who's an animator or a concept designer, where they often have to imbue everyday objects with life. Because uh, like maybe you have a character that's a vase, like in Beauty and the Beast. Uh, where, you know, all the household objects were people with personalities. So part of that is based, I think, on the character that you wanted to have. Like, is this vase or this candelabra a butler or a cook or a gardener? You know, someone from the household. Um, and that will help, it, I think, inform your decision about imbuing character into an everyday object. Like, what is that character, first and foremost? Um, I don't do a lot of that myself, so, uh, you know, trying to caricature inanimate objects. Uh, the closest I think I ever got was doing a caricature of R2-D2 for my Star Wars poster. and I just, I guess, made him more sh short and squatty, a little wider. Um, and that seemed to make him a little more cute. So I gave him proportions that were more, um, yeah, chubby or cute. It was the characters I was trying to imbue into him. Okay, let's go a little cooler now on the um, metal. I'm seeing a real cool section right here uh, in the middle of the vase that you maybe don't really see in the photo too much. And it is cooler, it's not, it's not cool yet, it's just a more grayed down version of that orange. Yeah, okay, just sampling more colors from the surrounding background to reflect into the uh, metal here. some interesting color notes in here too there are some I'm getting into the harder highlights now where I'm gonna be a little more bold about the colors I'm putting in like real warm here as we're building up towards that highlight on the uh, body of the vase so you gotta you gotta build up the colors around it before putting in that highlight you can't just slap a highlight on without working towards that goal There's just overall a vein of light running through the center of this vase. Well, not the center, but the right side. Uh, I'd say it gets cooler, though, as it goes up through the upper neck portion here. A little more gray. Okay, let's switch over to a harder brush now again. This is more of like a, a Filbert hog's hair brush. And I'm going to go ahead and start working on this highlight properly now. I'm going to sample the orange from the tablecloth. Get some nice chroma in there. 
I'll go ahead and zoom in a little bit so you can see better. I try not to zoom in on my painting as much as possible, but just for the sake of demonstrating when I'm working in smaller areas, might, I think it might be helpful. Jim asks, when working in oils, do you tend to let layers dry and then build layers over them, or is it more wet into wet? Yeah, I'm a wet into wet painter. I don't have the patience, I think, to be the layering kind of painter. Uh, but I do find myself having to layer sometimes just because paintings often take me several days to complete, and I just have to go over another area. But I usually don't tint the areas of dry paint. I'll just, I'll just paint over them again with more wet paint over dry um, but I, try, I do try to finish an area and then move on from it. If it's a large-scale painting, that's going to take me a while. Like, I'll do, say, this section of the background, and then I'll be finished with it. And I'll, you know, it'll be wet into wet with good blending and good edges, and then I won't ever touch it again. And I try to do that throughout the painting. And I try to stop in places. If I have to do that, I'll try to stop in a place where I can pick it up again without too much of a problem where there's a clear dividing line. Like, where there's a natural seam in an object, maybe. I hope that answers the question. Okay, let's go now. Let's go just full value. Let's get that highlight in here. I think it's a warm yellowish bright light, almost pure white here. Well, as, as high as you can go on the value scale while still maintaining some color. There we go. That's really yellow, really red, and that's that's what I'm seeing. It's a very orangish yellow light. But if I really want to punch it up even more to make it seem like a super, super bright light, I can move it closer to white and get rid of some of that yellow. And I'll just maybe punch that white in right at the center of that highlight to make it really feel like it's glowing. And maybe I can sample this yellowish color and repeat that same process up here. And I'm going to shrink down my brush a little bit. As the forms thin out, that highlight's going to get thinner, too. Remember, highlights have their own shape and design based on, you know, what's you know, the object beneath it, if it has texture or a shape underlying it. And a little bit of a highlight right here on the rim of that vase. And then there's a bit of a highlight on the uh, the stem, on the base here. Put some orange around it first, actually, to give it a little more chroma. And then the center will be a little more brightly lit. And the same thing goes for the rim down here, the lip, as it touches the table. There's a real bright point there. Okay, let's zoom out a little bit here. So hopefully it's coming together feeling a bit more like uh, realistic metal. It's very, very warm, but that's, yeah, that's, that's what I'm seeing here. It is a warm painting. I usually don't paint under such warm light conditions. I just, I usually go a little more balanced, but it's nice to change it up every now and then and get into something like this where it feels more like an old world style painting lit by candles. And the highlight on the apple, um, let's work towards that as well, because, you know, we're running out of time here. I think I'll go a little more chromatic, though. I'm sort of building up to that highlight. And this hard edge brush it can help simulate that those the streaks, the natural streaks that are in the surface of that apple. A nice hard edge back over here where it needs it too. And I think up by the top here there's darker and a little more red, a little more chromatic uh, colors on the top of the apple here.
and it's this combination of hard and soft edges that's going to sell the illusion of form. If you have it too soft everywhere, it's not going to look good. If it's too hard edges everywhere, it's again, it's not going to look as good. I think good paintings are a balance between hard and soft edges. A little reflected light here on the tablecloth. Okay, let's get back to this highlight. Let's move a little closer to yellow now and a little brighter. And let's go, I'd say it's, it's a very chromatic yellowish highlight because the apple's not as reflective as that, as the vase. So it's about, that's about as bright as it's gonna get and you'll, then you'll get the nice difference between these two surfaces. They look like very, very different surface types, which they are. Harden the edge right here past the, uh, past the base of the stem of the face. Okay, and I talked about wanting to do some of my blending brushes that I have, the streaky blenders. Let me show you some of those here. Uh, so here's a rough canvas streaky blender. And just to give you a sense of what that does, I'll just sort of grab that and see what that's doing there. It's blending, but it's blending like I'm dragging real paint through wet paint. And uh, I'm really happy with how this brush looks, actually. So, so I'm going to apply that to some of the shapes here where I want to soften the edges. But I'm not doing it in such a way that I'm killing all the pixels and blending them all together. They're very, um, it, it still feels a lot more natural and organic. And I, cu I could have maybe used this earlier in the painting, I just didn't. Because I tend to want to solve all my problems more through brush strokes rather than with blending tricks. Uh, but the blending tricks are pretty fun. You know, it's like to drag some of the uh, light and paint from the tablecloth into the uh, apple. It sort of welds the two shapes together, makes it feel like one's sitting on it. You know, it's just when you when you lose an edge a little bit like that. Uh, let's see. Hossein says your videos are very informative. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, Jim says, yes, this is gold. It's a great time to be learning how to draw and paint. Thanks, Court. <laughs> Thanks. I always appreciate the words of kindness you guys share. Uh, I really love connecting with all you guys during this time because we're still, you know, a lot of us are just locked down at home. We're not going out unless we absolutely have to. And it's really nice to have that human connection. I love being able to talk to you guys and answer questions. It makes me feel useful. Let's kind of bring some of that background into the surface of the vase here. Just I'm breaking up that edge, making it less monotonous. Uh, but I want to be restrained about it. It's just it's something you get the feeling for. You don't. There's no real rules to it, other than the rule that I usually like to tell myself is like where two values are very close together is a good place to blend an edge. But you can also do it where there's high amount of contrast too, like just where I did it up here by the vase, and. Uh, drag some paint in and out. It just kind of looks like I painted it with real wet paints because it's messy and sloppy. Just kind of how life is. That's how um, paints really work. If you drag the brush through wet paint into another uh, shape, it's gonna it's gonna contaminate it. What's that? What I got here? Oh, I've got history brush on here. That's the wrong brush. Gotta buy some fruits after this stream. <laughs> yep. Uh, thank you, Mary. I'm glad you're enjoying it. You know, another good place to use the streaky blender brush is on highlights, too, because if you can, like, wash out the highlights a little bit or give them some streaks, it makes them feel like, ooh, that's some real wet paint that that guy used there, sort of tricking the viewer. And it creates sort of a, a luminous feeling as well, just like it's because the paint's, like, spreading out. It's sort of like almost like a halo effect. There he goes. Add a little bit of a streakiness to that highlight there and makes it feel more natural, a little more broken up. And you can also use it on the metal just to create some cool uh, interplays between the uh, pigments on different parts of the metal. 
So thanks for bearing with me, guys. I know it's kind of sometimes, you know, uh, I wouldn't say boring watching paint dry or, you know, getting to, the pe getting to this place, but there often is, uh, you have to be patient to get to the payoff when you can start doing these cool effects. You have to build up these layers. And I could maybe work a little faster, but this is just how I work, I guess. So I'm just, just breaking up that edge, making it feel as part of the background, part of the scene. Seeing this apple here, maybe I'll streak some of the paint out here on the left. Maybe I'll clean up some of this here too in the um, middle part of the apple. Oh, you know, I gotta do... Um, just finish this up here. I gotta add the highlight on the uh, stem. And I think I'll use the color from the background here. And it's casting a shadow on the apple itself there. So hopefully you can see how all those imperfections start adding up and creates a really interesting effect that when you pull back, it feels more natural, feels like that could be a real apple with real texture. Uh, up close you can see all the brush strokes and how it's a little more abstract, but um, when you pull back and look back from a distance it just feels more natural. And that's the effect I like in my oil painting work as well. I like people to be able to uh, stand back and get one impression and then they get close to it and it's like oh it just breaks down this thing is just all loose crazy brush strokes I had no idea you know I, I like that magic to happen that's to me what's really appealing about painting is um, when it looks great from a distance and still looks great from close up but looks different just has a different effect and people can see that it's just a collection of wet loose paint mixed together Well, that's about it here. Let's see if there's any last minute questions. Uh, yeah, a few here. Um, Hossein says, how to train your eye for seeing color? Is there an exercise like hand-eye coordination and drawing? Does mixing color make your eye more sensitive to seeing colors? I think so. Um, and again, I'm going to refer back to my color theory video last week. Um, where I talked about the HVC color wheel. Where it's broken down by hue, value, and chroma. And if you recreate that color wheel, you get really good at analyzing color, judging your own color, how to mix color, how to solve problems in color. Just by doing that exercise where you're doing this very controlled set of goals uh, to make this color wheel perfect, where every uh, slice of the pie is the same value from high to low chroma. And uh, then it ramps down from a bright value at yellow to a perfectly almost black value down to purple. It's a really hard assignment to do, but that will... Again, to me, that was the best thing I ever did to understand color and how to control it and how to see it better was doing that color wheel. Not just looking at it, but actually creating it with oil paints. It's It can be done with uh, digital, but it's just not the same. You don't learn as much, I don't think. Uh, Eric says, uh, it reminds me of watching my teachers at Ringling. Oh, you went to Ringling. Yeah, it's a really good school. Real pretty, uh, too, uh, down in Florida, right? Yeah, walked around the campus once. Uh, Hossein says, is that what painters mean by seeing certain colors because they know what it's mixed from? I don't know. Uh, color is just so subjective. Um, some people, again, might have different color acuity where some people see more colors when they look at stuff or they might be on a spectrum of color blindness where they don't maybe see as much difference between reds or greens. Um, and you may not know it. You maybe just go through your whole life thinking, oh, that's just how color is. I don't understand how that artist is seeing so much color in there. Well, maybe they have ability to see more color. Um, but yeah, when you start to see the thing in front of you, like this still life setup that I'm working with, uh, it's 
you can see the colors bouncing around. You see the color from the background and you want to put it into the composition just because it's there. Um, and you start to see more subtle variations of color tempers just by looking at something. Again, it's really, really helpful to look at things in real life and not from photos. So get away from photos if you're doing color painting practice. Set up some kind of still life and, and work on that. And then try to do a variety of subjects, a variety of materials and patinas. Like do glass, do wood, do plastic, do fruit, do metal, do leather or cloth. Because uh, they all behave and act very differently. Because if you want to be a painter painter, if you want to be an illustrator... Um, I can show you like all these great works of art where there are still lifes everywhere in art. Like if someone's, if you're doing a portrait of somebody sitting at a table, well, that table and the, the plate on the table and the flowers on the table, those are all still lifes. And uh, if you don't feel comfortable with painting still lifes or just random objects, uh, you're going to have a hard time wanting to put them in your artwork and your artwork won't be as fleshed out because um, you shy away from that. And the same thing with landscapes. That's a whole other thing, but... Every now and then you find yourself having or needed to, needing to paint a landscape in the background of something. Well, the more landscape painting you do in real life, the more comfortable you'll be with it in understanding how to make a landscape look good. Because the problems you encounter with landscape painting are a little different because the light's changing and you have to work faster. Um, in still life painting, you don't, you don't have to deal with that, but um, do a little bit of everything uh, in art. Paint people, paint ba backgrounds and landscapes, paint interiors and architecture. Uh, that's something I have a weakness, actually. I don't do a lot of interior scenes uh, with uh, realistic interiors, and so that's something that I tend to shy away from where I figure out how to get away from having to do it if, it call, if the assignment calls for it. Uh, or if I do figure it out. I think I did this one like family Christmas card once for a company, and it was an interior scene, and it was okay. I, I used some of my landscape painting background to help me figure out how to stage and set up and paint a, a background of an internal, an interior room that was not too dreary looking let's see uh not boring at all thank you uh you love how, you, how i explain every choice i make it's interesting as watching a good movie oh thank you uh let's see axel says if the value is higher than intended should we you should we use darken it through adjusts or just paint over it um yeah when you're working with photoshop you do have these tools at your disposal where you can add adjustment layers on top of something to maybe give it a unified color. Uh, but to me, those are a little bit of, you know, cheating. They're cheating you out of understanding how to solve the problem um, naturally. Um, you want to just build up your good fundamental painting, color, and drawing skills so that you don't need to necessarily readjust things later using filters or adjustment layers. Um, but, you know, the real world, I understand how it is. You got deadlines and you don't want to spend forever figuring something out and you got to work, you know, before your skills are maybe 100%. Your skills are never going to be 100%. You gotta just start producing work for clients and work for your portfolio. So yeah, until then, whatever you need to do to get a painting to look good, I think is fine, it's all fair game. Um, but if you ever wanna paint traditionally with oils and acrylics and watercolors, um, there's less leeway, there's less cheats that you can do. Um, you can bring those paintings into the computer and add effects on top of them, of course. But um, try to figure out how to do it with paint and pigment and brushes. All right, so we're a little over time here. I guess we're uh, just about at the end here. Uh, thanks again for sticking with me with all the technical stuff at the beginning. One of these days I'm going to figure out this um, streaming thing. Uh, let's uh, see where we're at here. Do, do, do. My mouse is acting a little jumpy too, and I got a brand new mouse. There we go. Here I'm back. Okay. Um, you know, this is my new favorite thing right now. I just got this mouse. It's uh, silent. It's totally silent. Uh, I was getting kind of tired of hearing those mouse clicks, and I needed a new mouse anyway. This is the uh, Microsoft M30, th the M330, uh, and it's just billed as a silent mouse. There's a lot of other mice on the market that are also silent, but here's my old mouse, and here's the new one. It just, it's so silent. I love it, and when you're doing recording and live streaming, um, it's good to have more silent, you know, keyboards and mice if you can. Um, I don't know, I just wanted to share that. It's just a fun thing here. Anyway, um, join me next week. I'll let you guys know what my next live stream is going to be. Maybe I'll paint the same subject with a cool background, or maybe not. Let me know in the comments if you want to see me paint this in a uh, cool uh, color palette from my other photo next week. Or if maybe I'll just think of a new subject. I'll, I'll try to look at the comments again in the chat and uh, see what people were asking about and, and farm that for new uh, ideas for my live streams. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you for joining me. It's been a pleasure, and I'll uh, talk to you soon.